everyone again. Uh, welcome to Trinity Bible Church's Wednesday evening prayer meeting. Um, I'm Bill Gauss. For those of you who might be watching for the first time online, um, those of you who know me well, uh, welcome. And uh, we miss you very much. I speak on behalf of Valerie, my children, and me, of course. Um, we really miss seeing you face to face, and we are anxiously waiting for the day that we can once again meet. Um, Lord willing, that's going to be sooner than later. Um, according to the president's uh, most recent uh, speeches there on the uh, task force uh, that you might see on television, um, sounds like we might be getting the economy back up and running again by Easter, and we hope and pray that that's, the, uh, that's really the way it's going to go. Um, uh, but uh, if not, of course, we uh, will just continue uh, doing these videos um, for the foreseeable future and um, hope they're a blessing to you. But really, they're no substitute for uh, meeting together um, and worshiping together uh, as a congregation. Uh, so we're going to be looking at uh, the book of First Peter again. Um, tonight we're going to look at uh, First Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, uh, jam-packed full of doctrine there, and we hope you're blessed by it. <clears throat> but before we open up the Word of God, let's uh, bow in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful that we can meet here um, online. Um, we hope it's a blessing and an encouragement to the people. We know that uh, where your word goes, that uh, it will never return to you void. And that's our prayer this evening, that uh, truly it uh, is a useful uh, benefit to the people who are watching this, uh, both near and far from our congregation and even beyond. Uh, Lord, tonight we pray for a little Emma in uh, uh, South Carolina, I believe, um, and her family. We understand that she has gone through some surgeries to relieve the pressure on her brain, that she's responding to various uh, um, uh, sensations there from uh, the doctors. And we pray that uh, you would continue working in that little girl's body and in the lives of their parents and family, of her parents and family, should I say, um, and even people that know them. Uh, may their actions be godly actions and reactions to the situation and may more people um, be introduced to Jesus Christ uh, by their actions and reactions to the, to the situation. Uh, we pray for our congregation. Um, we pray that you would keep them safe. We haven't heard of any infections, um, but I know my grandfather is not feeling well, and uh, we pray for him this evening. Uh, we pray for anyone else who is not feeling well uh, or just really uh, dealing with the effects of isolation. I know uh, my family and I are uh, struggling with that. Um, it's tough being locked inside, especially on a rainy day, um, like we've, the rainy days that we've had this week. Uh, for little girls, that's a, that's a tough thing. And even for parents that are dealing with uh, child care at home, I pray that you would bless them and uh, it's, I, I, I sound like I'm, I'm saying anything negative. This has really been a real blessing for us, uh, being able to be with our children every single day and to teach them to be um, their uh, full-time teachers. It's really been a blessing to be able to teach them um, uh, Bible lessons even throughout the day. And we just pray that uh, while this, uh, isol this time of isolation continues, that you would help us be... Um, teachers to them, godly mothers and fathers, and godly uh, people of God so that we can um, show the love of Jesus Christ to our neighbors, our family, our friends. And uh, we appreciate all of the opportunities that you give to us to uh, preach the gospel and to show the love of Jesus. And we pray for many more opportunities as the days go on, especially as we come out of isolation whenever that might be. Uh, I just pray for the safety, the continued safety of our people and our, our, our nation. I pray for our president. I pray for our leaders in Congress who can't seem to really make uh, decisions, but uh, what, a, what an incredible decision they have to make. I don't envy them with uh, trillions of dollars in the, uh, in the works. I just, I, it's a number I can't even really fathom. 
And Lord, I pray that as they make that decision that uh, the future of our nation is uh, uh, just, it, it turns out uh, so that the economy rebounds and that we do well. Uh, but we also know that everything is in, um, in your plan. And help us to accept all of the things, all of the changes that may take place because of this um, uh, disease, this virus that has been spreading throughout the world. Uh, help us to be uh, well with whatever comes down the line. Um, we know you're in charge and we worship you for it. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said before, we're going to look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. While you might be turning in your Bibles to um, that uh, passage, I hope you got our most recent email uh, from the leadership. Uh, we were talking about uh, the possibility of doing some old-fashioned journaling, and uh, we hope that that is a blessing to you. Don't think of it as something that you um, have to do and that you have to be uh, deep about. This is simply just what are you going through? Uh, we want to know and we want to share uh, with each other when we get back to meeting together. Um, so yeah, we hope that that was an encouragement to you. I'll be sending out our new question probably tomorrow. Um, there were enough questions in that first, uh, um, uh, uh, the first round that I sent out to you. Um, that uh, you you uh, hopefully are getting a good start. So uh, let's uh, let's uh, go to First Peter chapter one verses three through five. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to His great mercy, He has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. When I was in seminary, I had to read a book by G.C. Burkauer, uh, and in it he wrote something that I'll never forget. In fact, I, I keep it at the front of my mind whenever I'm doing um, theology or whenever I'm studying. Uh, and this is what he wrote. He said, All sound theology must begin and end with doxology. And again, all sound theology must begin and end with doxology. Uh, it's a great and seriously wonderful insight because when theology doesn't begin and end with doxology, it's nothing more than something that is as intellectual as math, science, or any other subject in school. When theology begins and ends with doxology, we engage our hearts and our souls are moved by, uh, towards God. So right as he gets to some of the most heavy theological concepts, Paul, for instance, breaks out into doxology. Uh, in Romans, which we're studying in Sunday school, in Romans chapter 11, verse 33, uh, he writes, Oh, the depths and the riches of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. Peter, like Paul, begins with a doxology here. Uh, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. Verse 3. If you don't know what a doxology is, it is simply a hymn of praise. The word comes from the Greek doxa, uh, which is a word that's used to speak of the glory that belongs only to God. Uh, it's been his from eternity past, that glory that is. Uh, it is intrinsic to God's nature. Uh, the concept of glory in the Bible refers to the awesomeness of the characteristics of God, all of them. Uh, singing praise to God is central to worship, as you might remember from that series on worship we did. Um, we often think that the best things we can do as godly people is offer our money, our time, or body. But actually, the most significant sacrifice we can offer God is the sacrifice of praise. Doxology is at the very heart of true worship, and that's how Peter begins. Uh, Peter's doxology is also related to the greeting uh, initially. Peter wrote this letter to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And then he further specifies his audience as those who are elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Um, 
in his epistle to the Romans, Paul, and you might, you might wonder why I'm bringing that in. It's because Paul and Peter are so paralleled here in their theology. Um, so in his epistle to Romans, Paul mentions predestination. And in very, he, he does so very closely to God's foreknowledge. He mentions predestination close with God's foreknowledge. He says, For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among, men, among many brethren. Christians who want to live their lives biblically must have a doctrine of election and of predestination. These concepts were not invented by Augustine in his debate with Pelagius, or by Luther in his debate with Erasmus, or by Calvin, Calvin in his debate with Pigius, or by Edwards in his debate with Chubb. These concepts of election and predestination are found in Scripture. If you really want to be biblical as a Christian, it is incumbent upon you to hold to the biblical doctrine of predestination and of election and nothing else, no other constructs. Throughout church history, one of the more popular views of election or predestination has been the prescient view. The prescient view. Uh, prescience means pre-science or foreknowledge. Since Paul in Romans first says, uh, he first speaks of foreknowledge and then of predestination, those who hold to the prescient view believe that God's act of election or predestination must somehow be related to his foreknowledge. The prescient view says that God looks down the corridors of time and knows that some people will say yes to the offer of the gospel and that some will say no. In other words, some will cooperate with the grace that God makes available while others will reject it. On the basis of this prior knowledge that God has, he chooses or elects those people he knows will positively respond to the gospel. That view, however, cannot possibly be squared with Romans 8, not to mention Romans 9, nor can it explain the doctrine of election. It basically denies it, or it tries to get around it. Human beings, naturally, by nature, human beings hate the doctrine of sovereign election by it just is what it is. We, we don't like to hear that. The word foreknowledge comes before the words election and predestination in Romans 8 because God never elects nameless, faceless nothings. He elects real people. Therefore, those whom God elects, he knows. Predestination is related to divine foreknowledge inasmuch as as God knows what he intends to do in the future. So how does God, even in his transcendent majesty, have the ability to know the end from the beginning? How is it possible for God to have knowledge of future things? God doesn't have a crystal ball that he looks into that shows him the decisions we'll make in the future. Rather, God knows the future because he ordained it. He knows his own plan in advance, and he knows it certainly because he has decreed it so. And this is what I've been talking about on Sunday nights when I've said over and over again that God's foreknowledge is based on and in his decree. In other words, he knows all things because he has decreed all things. His decrees are not based on any human condition that God foreknows. That would actually make the creature sovereign. But we can even put it another way. If God did look into the future, down those corridor of time, to see the responses that people would make, the only response that fallen human beings would have to his grace would be unbelief. It would be rejection. People are not elect because they have faith. They are elected unto faith. That is, they are elected to have faith. Faith itself is the result of God's electing grace. Peter's doxology isn't separated from the greetings that he said earlier. They're part of a whole that's similar to Paul's writings, as we said a number of times. Whenever Paul deals with the doctrine of election, he rejoices in it, and he gives glory where glory should always be given, to God and God alone. 
Similarly, Peter begins his epistle with this doxology, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He begins by describing God as being the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ. The New Testament concept of Jesus Christ being the Son of God is central to biblical theology. Not only is Jesus the Son of God, but he is also what the Apostle John describes as the monogenes, the only Son of God. And we have a tendency today to miss the significance of that. Uh, instead of hearing that Christ is God's only Son, we repeatedly hear that we are all God's children. People today believe in the universal fatherhood of God and the universal brotherhood of man. Uh, in biblical categories, God, in the natural sense, is the father of one. And when I say natural sense, that is, that is one of his characteristics. Uh, he is the father of one. He is the father of the Son, the only begotten Son. Christ is the Son of God by nature. Scripture tells us that by nature we are children of wrath. We're children of Satan. So we should never take for granted the privilege of calling God Abba, Father. By nature, he is only the Father of Christ, and by extension, he only becomes our Father when we are adopted into his family. Jesus is by nature the Son of God, we are by nature children of wrath, and only become his children supernaturally. The object of Peter's doxology is the first person of the Trinity, and he's called the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a bit of irony in Peter saying that God is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, because the title Lord, the Greek word Kyrios, is the translation of the Old Testament title Adonai, and that was reserved for God alone. It's the highest title of God, and it calls attention to God's sovereignty. Uh, elsewhere, Paul writes, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant, and becoming in the likeness, and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God has also highly exalted him, and given him the name which is above every name. Uh, the name above every name in that text is not Jesus. People often jump to that conclusion because the next name mentioned is the name of Jesus. But when the Father bestows the name that is above every name on Jesus, the name he gives is Lord. He gives Jesus this title, and at the name of Jesus every knee will bow to the Jew. The bowing of the knee doesn't just refer to submission to an earthly king, but it's actually an act of worship. In the New Testament, people are often rebuked for bowing to angels and offering adoration to them. Because as, the, as high as the angels might be, they are not divine. They're not worthy of worship. They even say so. At the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that he is Adonai, Kyrios, Lord. Rather than detract from the glory of the Father, the Apostle says, is unto the glory of the Father. It's unto the glory of the Father that every knee should bow. So the first confession of faith in biblical days was the shortest and, and very simple creed, Jesus ha curios, curios, which means Jesus is Lord. It means Jesus is sovereign, our sovereign. Along with the Father, he shares the fullness of deity and sovereignty. And it is the Father himself who is pleased to give that title, Kyrios, to his only begotten Son. Not only is there a reference to election, but there's also a specific reference to regeneration or rebirth, which we're talking about on Sunday nights. This is commonly uh, distorted in our culture by the idea that we have to have faith in order to be born uh, again or elect. But the sovereign God from all eternity decrees those 
he will give the gift of faith, which is the fruit of regeneration. It's not the cause of it. Orthodox Christians have long said that regeneration precedes faith. During the Reformation, this was actually a statement that defined Protestants over and against Roman Catholics. We tend to get it backwards and think that our faith is what causes us to be reborn. Unless we are born of the Spirit, as Jesus said to Nicodemus, we cannot see the kingdom of God, let alone enter it. Regeneration is what incites and plants faith in our souls. Let me say that again. Regeneration is what incites and plants faith in our souls. By grace, God sovereignly supplies the very condition that God requires for our justification. If we try to place faith before regeneration, we actually are expecting the impossible. In the end, we expect the natural to rise up to the supernatural. We expect those who are dead in sin and trespasses to exercise spiritual life. Paul wrote to the Ephesians that God, even when we were dead in trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved through faith. Ephesians 2.5 Every woman, every pregnant woman knows what it's like to have that uh, uh, baby kicking inside. It's when they first feel, it's called quickening, uh, the old term, quickening. Uh, it's used in scripture. It's used in theology quite a bit. That's when the woman will first feel life in her womb. Um, that's the metaphor that Paul gives to the Ephesians of what the Holy Spirit does to people while they're dead. We are as passive in our rebirth as we were in our natural birth. We had nothing to do with causing our own conception in our mother's womb, and we have nothing to do with our spiritual rebirth either. That is a work of God. Even Jesus' own humanity was generated supernaturally. When the angel Gabriel came to Mary and said that she would have a baby who would save people from their sins, she said to the angel, how can this be since I have not known a man? She understood basic biology, of course. Virgins don't have babies. But Gabriel explained it to her. He said the Holy Spirit would come upon her and overshadow her so that the baby generated in her womb would be holy and from God. The language in that enunciation is the same that we find in Genesis chapter 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. The deep didn't have the power to conquer the darkness until the Spirit of God hovered over the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. No life originated from some kind of cosmic accident. Life came through the only being who has the power to create ex nihilo, the life-generating pow power of God. That same power is what Gabriel described to Mary about her conception. The child in her womb was generated not by nature, not by natural means, but by supernatural power. In that same way, our spiritual birth is by the same spirit and power. We are absolutely powerless again. We're absolutely powerless to affect our rebirth. Only God in his supernatural power can cause us to be born again. You didn't generate it or seek after God. He sought after you. In his mercy and grace, the Spirit of God invaded your soul and changed that heart of stone. He changed it to a heart of flesh. He gave you the desire for Christ and brought you to Christ actually as a gift to Christ. You happen to be one of those whom the Father was pleased to give to the Son, not because there was anything pleasant about you, but so that the Son might be satisfied. How can that cause anything in us uh, besides doxology? It's beyond me. When used in the Bible, the word hope means something different than it does in our secular culture. In our co culture, Hope reflects our desires, which are subjective. Something like, I hope that something will take place in the future, but I don't know for sure that it will. Biblically speaking, our hope is certain. We know for sure that God will do everything he says he will do in the future. We have been born again to a living and lasting hope. 
this hope is inseparably related to the resurrection because it was grounded in the reality that when God raised his son from the dead, he raised him as the firstborn among many, many of, of many brethren, and that all who are in him will share in that resurrection life. We have been born again not just to have a better quality of life in this world, not simply to be given a second chance, but to live a life that actually goes on forever, a life that is sustained by the power of the resurrected Christ. All of this language, of course, is tied up with family terminology, children, fathers, birth, rebirth. And now Peter introduces the concept of inheritance. Verse 4, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Sometimes we dream of getting a letter. I know I do. Sometimes we dream of getting a letter that says, congratulations, we just read the will of some extended deceased person in your family, and he has left you his entire estate, five million dollars. Yeah, it's nice. it would be nice, but we think of an inheritance as a kind of chance happening. Here, however, Peter is talking about another inheritance. It's not of this world. We can't cash in on this inheritance like we would a will from an extended deceased family member or in a way similar to the prodigal son. The inheritance Peter is talking about is the living hope that is, quote, kept in heaven for you. That hope was not just for believers who received this letter in Asia Minor, of course. It is for you and me as well. If we have been reborn in the power of the Spirit, we've been reborn to a living hope and to an inheritance that is reserved for us in heaven. It is that inheritance that first belonged only to the Son of God. When we were adopted and reborn into the family of God, we become heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. Whatever inheritance God the Father has reserved for his Son, he now shares with all those who have been adopted into in the Son. Peter doesn't tell us, he doesn't tell us exactly what the inheritance is at this point, but he does describe it, and he tells us three things about it. First, it is imperishable. Your translation might say incorruptible. Our inheritance cannot be destroyed. Like many of us have realized with the current crisis we're going through in our nation and the world, when we make an investment in the stock market, we are taking a risk because that investment might fail. The inheritance reserved for us in heaven, however, is not subject to the ups and downs of the stock market. This inheritance is incorruptible. It will not be corrupted because it cannot be corrupted. This inheritance is also undefiled. It was purchased with Christ's perfect pure blood. It's not dirty money. It's so protected by God in heaven that nothing, nothing, will ever spoil or defile it. It is undefiled because it cannot be undefiled. And lastly, Peter says our inheritance is unfading. It will never fade away. The flower fades, the grass withers, but the word of the Lord and the inheritance of the saints never fade away. Isaiah chapter 40 verse 8. This inheritance is reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the, by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, verse 5. Here, Peter speaks of salvation in the future. In Christian language, we talk about being saved. We might say, I was saved, you fill in the blank, however many years ago. I was saved 20 years ago. When we say that, we mean that we came to faith that we've been justified and we've entered into salvation. In a certain sense, we were saved at that moment because the Bible uses the verb to save in every tense of the Greek language. But there is also a tense, a sense, I apologize, a sense in which we were saved from the foundation of the world. We were being saved, we are saved, and we are being saved but ultimately, we will be saved when we enter into the fullness of the inheritance that is being reserved for us in heaven. So while it is being kept for eternity, that same power that keeps the inheritance reserved for us is that power that keeps us reserved 
for the inheritance. Let me say that again. The same power that keeps the inheritance reserved for us is the same power that keeps us reserved for the inheritance. It is the power of God that keeps us to receive the full and final measure of salvation. Now, do you see why Peter gives a doxology? I hope you do. I hope you do, and I hope you're singing a doxology to yourself, maybe even the doxology that we know from our hymn book. In this short opening statement, Peter gives us the heart and soul of the Christian faith, and we'll continue there next week. I hope you've been blessed by this study. Uh, Peter, The book of 1 Peter is a wonderful book. I have enjoyed uh, studying this more deeply since we started last week, uh, and I hope that uh, you've been blessed by it and edified by it. Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for our salvation. We're so grateful that you uh, have chosen us before the foundation of the world. We don't deserve it at all. It's by grace that we've been saved through faith. Thank you for that faith. Thank you for the gift of your Son coming to earth. Thank you for adopting us. Thank you for being who you are, the sovereign God of heaven and earth, the universe that you've created. You are so awesome. You are so holy, and we are so un unworthy of those gifts that you've given us. But Lord, you have, and for that we are so grateful. Lord, just bless us this week as we minister to our family first. We're isolated here. Then bless us as we minister to our, our people, our congregation, as we reach out to them Bless them, keep them, keep them safe. Lord, we ask that you would continue working in all of our lives. Lord, we ask that you would continue working in our nation and the world. We ask that your will be done on heaven as, in heaven as it is on earth. And Lord, we thank you for just being the God that you are. We love you. And we uh, oh, can't wait to meet together again. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I will uh, see you uh, here online. Maybe even in the next couple of days, I'll be posting uh, something, maybe some music uh, for your enjoyment um, and your edification and sanctification. And um, just please keep on studying the Word of God. Please don't uh, keep those Bibles shut. Open them daily. This is a perfect time uh, to study. We'll see you guys later.